Hello and welcome. Welcome to Diverse Conversations. This is Ashka Patel. Thank you very much for joining me today as we continue our journey exploring sustainability in healthcare and pharmacy. Today in episode number four, I am very excited to introduce our guest, none other than Terry Drover from Health Product Stewardship Association. Terry is the Director General at HPSA, a Canadian not-for-profit that runs take-back programs for unwanted medications and used sharps. Before joining HPSA, Terry spent over 30 years in the pharmaceutical industry, holding various decision-making roles for pharmaceutical companies in North America, including Procter & Gamble, Apotex, Sandoz, and Wyeth Pharmaceuticals. Her breadth of experience um, spans sales and marketing, regulatory affairs, government relations, and distribution. As Director General at HPSA, Terry leads the strategic direction of the team to fulfill their mission of protecting the health and safety of Canadians and the environment from the improper disposal of unwanted medications and new sharps. She's passionate about bridging the gap between healthcare and the environment, and she has been a board member of the Canadian Association for Healthcare Reimbursement, Canadian Foundation for Pharmacy, and GS1 Pharmacy Sector, a not-for-profit organization that develops and maintains global standards for business. She is also currently a volunteer board member for CHATS, a community and home assistance to seniors. And to share more about Health Product Stewardship Association, it is basically an organization that bridges between healthcare and environment, operating take-back programs for the safe disposal of unwanted medications and use sharps in Ontario, British Columbia, Manitoba, and Prince Edward Island. They are growing their programs, and you'll hear about that from Terry shortly. Their mandate supports the preservation of the environment and the protection of communities through the facilitation of the disposal of unwanted products and by building public awareness um, of the need for proper and safe disposal. HPSA's members are producers, which includes owners, licenses, licensees, importers, or sellers of health products to, um, sold to consumers in regulated provinces. Helping producers fulfill their EPR and CHR obliga CSR obligations, HPSA's programs are made available free to the public through pharmacy partnerships. To learn more about HPSA and to learn more about the programs that they offer, I'm excited to welcome Terry to this conversation. Before we go there though, I'd kindly request a huge favor if you could like and subscribe below and make sure to support our channel and provide any feedback that you may have about the series as you continue to tune into these conversations as your feedback is greatly appreciated. Now, without further ado, let's go to meet Terry. All right. Well, welcome back. And now we have Terry joining us. Terry, thank you so much for taking this time to have this conversation with us here on Diverse Conversations podcast. Um, as I have been really looking forward to this conversation with you uh, to really understand, you know, the journey of medications and healthcare related um, waste as it travels through. And, you know, the incredible work that you're leading at Health Product Stewardship Association. So thank you again for joining us. Aska, thank you for reaching out. I'm really uh, happy to be here and uh, have this opportunity to talk a little bit more about sustainability in pharmacy. Thank you very much. Um, and Terry, I guess with uh, with that, I certainly would love to introduce, um, you know, a little bit about, you know, your journey, if you can speak to that a little bit in terms of, you know, what led you to your current role um, as the executive director of HPSA. Um, and if you could just share a little bit about that, that would be fantastic. So as you can tell by my white hair, I've been around a while. So I've had a long and journeyed career, a very exciting career, predominantly in pharmaceuticals, although I did start originally in healthcare, mm -hmm. uh, the nursing degree and an MBA. Um, so I spent the bulk of my time working within pharmaceutical companies, but in various roles. For example, I started in research, went into sales and marketing, and then eventually became more of an executive uh, uh, C-suite leader for many of the pharmaceutical companies. So also, uh, I've always been, uh, being raised on the East Coast of Canada, I've mm -hmm. had a close connection with the oceans mm -hmm. and resources. So this was always a keen interest of mine to uh, protect our natural, beautiful environment here in Canada. Absolutely. So I have to apologize, asking my dog just came back for a walk, so you can't, <laughs> you can't predict these things. That's completely fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> So I think the combination of my experience in pharmaceuticals, as well as my keen interest in, in the environment and mm -hmm. obviously patient safety as a nurse, all came 
together with this position. So it's one of those perfect positions at the perfect point in my career. And it allowed me to take uh, on this challenge with a lot of enthusiasm and uh, develop a team that are equally as enthusiastic in this space. Absolutely. And and obviously, like, you know, I can I can tell from, you know, the, the work that I have read about in terms of the work that you're leading through this organization, it's no small feat, you know, what you uh, the the endeavor that you have taken upon and the change you're wanting to make. Um, and if you could share a little bit about that, you know, like what is the uh, what is HPSA's uh, mission and like, you know, what are some of the goals that you're aiming to achieve um, under your leadership? So predominantly, we're, we act as sort of the bridge between patient safety and the environment. Hmm. Uh, and and it's, when I first took on this role, uh, I was even surprised at how few people were taking back unwanted or expired medications to pharmacies. Yes. And it, really, I mean, I've, I've uh, been in the U.S. quite a bit. I, I worked in the U.S. and I actually asked a pharmacist once in the U.S., what do I do with this stuff? And he goes, mix it with kitty litter and throw it in the garbage. Wow. Your so I thought this doesn't make sense to me because, you know, the landfills leach into the water systems, the water systems impact our health and safety. At the same time, it wasn't uh, appropriate to keep them in my house. I had small kids at home and I didn't want them, even when people think vitamins and over the counter medications can mm -hmm. be harmless, taking in enough quantities, they can also uh, be dangerous. So I've, I understand that um, and not, not everyone was aware of how to manage this or the importance of how to manage this. So at HPSA, every two years, we do a consumer survey. Okay. Just level set our understanding of what the current practices are in Canada and what the current knowledge levels of consumers are. Hmm. And with that information, we've discovered that almost 60% of Canadians didn't know how to properly dispose wow. of their medications. 60%. So, Although the good news was up to 70% were saying we would want to do it because we mm -hmm. think it's the right thing to do. So there's certainly a need. There's a gap in knowledge there. And HPSA, one of our big strategic initiatives is to fill that gap with the right information. Right. And the best way to do that, believe it or not, is through pharmacies because they, are, they act as our collection location sites. They're the trusted healthcare professional for the bulk of consumers. They're accessible. And one of the questions in our survey was, who do you rely on most for your health information? Pharmacists, 60 to 70% of our respondents says, that's who we rely on for our health information. So if we can provide pharmacists with the right information and support, who they then in turn can support the consumers, we think we can move that needle of participation and making sure that people aren't uh, improperly disposing of. Absolutely, absolutely. And thank you so much for sharing those statistics. Um, you know, as a pharmacist, I mean, it, it's definitely a proud moment for me to know that, um, you know, patients, um, you do, do see a value in terms of like, you know, the, the information that we're able to provide to them. However, that said, I, I do know very well, like, you know, even my own understanding of like, you know, the medication disposal programs or, um, you know, it, it's just like, you know, what happens to medications once they are expired? And like, you know, once we send them off in this tote, I don't even know what happens. Um, and so it, you know, as healthcare providers, it also becomes our own responsibility as well to making sure um, that we understand this. And that's why I was so excited to have you on board here today so that, you know, we could learn a little bit about the programs that you offer and also kind of glean some insights from you. You. Uh, because, you know, before we kind of go into the programs, I think uh, one thing that I think is always important to address is, you know, what's the problem? Um, and it's like, you know, why is sustainability in pharmacy and in healthcare so important? Um, and, you know, what is it that if we don't choose sustainability, what is the cost that we're willing to pay? And I know you kind of alluded to that a little bit earlier, but if you could expand a little bit on that, that'd be fantastic. So we recently participated in an OECD webinar, and uh -huh. they had done quite a bit of research on the impact of pharmaceutical waste on the environment. Okay. So as I said, there's two, two separate issues here. There's the impact of improperly disposed waste on our, our environment, which inevitably impacts your health. Mm -hmm. But there's also the immediate risk of maintaining it in your household uh, and the risk to children, pets, what have you. Right. But speaking to the environmental impact, and this is an area where we're seeing the younger generation take a keen interest in. Um, the OECD had done a, a, a 
quite a huge research, uh, expansive research paper and published on the impacts of pharmaceuticals on the water systems and the aquatic systems. Mm. For example, they focused on hormones in the wastewater treatment and how it impacted the, the, the ability of certain aquatic species to reproduce. Wow. Impacted the, the reproductive capabilities, uh, mood modifiers, mm-hmm. uh, how that uh, impacted their behavior, uh, their ability to migrate. Um, wow. So there's significant impact. Uh, oh, and then, of course, the one everyone re- thinks about is antimicrobial re- resistance through uh, you know, antibiotics being dumped in wastewaters. And people eat the fish and the fish are you know, uh, have the metabolites of the antibiotics. So all of these things we don't often think about in Canada because we have the world's largest supply of fresh water yes. and we're very proud of that. But with that, I want to protect that even more to make sure that these chemicals aren't leaching either through landfills mm-hmm. or when you flush them down the toilets, you think they're going to be treated in a wastewater facility, so they'll be fine. They don't treat for pharmaceuticals, right? The wastewater's uh, treatment is usually for you know bacteria. Uh, they may add chlorine for 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 certain other issues, but they cannot possibly filter out the thousands of molecules that are in the market that may be being flushed down the toilet. So, I think people take a false secure a sense of false security when they mm-hmm. flush down the toilet that they're going to go through some you know treatment uh, uh, process and they'll yes. be fine. Right. Exactly. So, it's like washing exactly. your hands off it and it's somebody else's responsibility now. <laughs> exactly. So we were trying to impress upon uh, consumers as well as pharmacists for your own practice, make sure you, you dispose of things properly and keep them out of the waste systems. And as well, as you well know, when people have medications in their home, there are certain medications you really don't want to keep in your home if you don't need them, like opioids. Yes, the minute you're no longer requiring them or if they've expired, we need them out of there. And this is a very quick and simple way. Bring them back to your pharmacy. We'll make sure they get disposed of properly and don't end up hurting somebody or the environment. Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to emphasize that with people when even when pharmacists dispense opioids, please don't keep them consumer in your home if you don't need them any longer. Bring them back here. We'll make sure they're they're taken care of. So th- those are very important things. And I think we're trying to work harder to reach consumers mm-hmm. about these significant impacts. The fact that we've even found pharmaceutical waste in the Great Lakes in Canada, wow. and we're about to do further research um, on the impacts of that on the aquatic systems in the Great Lakes as well. So we we are one of the most advanced countries ask us. So I think we can sort of pound our chest a little bit as Canadians that we're leading the way in some of these pharmaceutical waste take back programs. The U S is a bit of a patchwork quilt of what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, We have the second biggest sharp take back program in the world. uh, Second France. So uh, think about the almost 3 million kilograms of medical sharps we've kept out of landfills. That's incredible. And we don't often hear about these, right? Uh, we like, but, but this is something we should definitely be proud of. And we need to further, you know, make sure that any of the remaining sharps that are not potentially going through these take back programs are entering into that system to protect, you know, our landfills, our, our people who are working in those landfills and everyone else involved. Um, thank you so much, Terry, for sharing that. And, you know, that and I think this is um, this is a beauty of these conversations as, you know, we we raise this awareness and we share these insights, especially the expertise that you bring to this table, um, because, you know, oftentimes, a lot of the times, as we were talking about earlier, you know, we, we kind of focus on our own little action and our own little world. And we, we forget that our actions have consequences that far reach our household um, for like, you know, case in point about, you know, how medication waste flush down can enter into our water system. Um, and, you know, it, it's not being treated for right reasons because there's thousands of molecules, as you mentioned. So it's not like you, they can they can treat the water for that because uh, we would not have 
water i think at that point because the processing will take so long uh, at least that's my understanding of it but you know this is this is great to hear that at least you know we're we're doing we're going in that in that right direction where we're we're you know creating these research programs and i think research builds that evidence for us to then say hey like you know this is what we are doing and i think um you know that kind of leads me to my next question for you is you know how is hpsa addressing these challenges and like you know um what are some of the programs and services um, that you provide um, to Canadians? Because I know you have operations throughout Canada now. So it would, I would love to hear that and kind of share that with our audience as well. So we currently operate in four provinces and uh, by 2025, we'll be in a three additional provinces. Wow. So we'll be quasi-national at that point. Some of the things we've done, uh, first and foremost, we provide free medical sheriff's containers to any consumer in Canada that requires one if they're uh, injecting at home. Mm -hmm. uh, those sheriff's containers are made of recycled materials. So mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to walk the walk as well and, and look at our own sustainability practices internally. Uh, we partner with a number of um, uh, interested patient advocacy groups, like we're partnering with Drug Free Kids Canada. We've done it in the past to do a survey. Where are you keeping your medications? How are you disposing of your medications? The importance of getting them out of your house. Yes. For we both have a common uh, goal with regards yes. to. That. We also do campaigns mm -hmm. and we put a lot of effort and sophistication behind the promotion of those media campaigns. Mm -hmm. So in August, we'll have a drug drop off month. Mm -hmm. And we promote this on media. You'll see it in bu um, bus shelters, uh, you know, clean out your cabinets, bring everything back to your pharmacies. Um, we've had the support of many of our members, some of our bigger member companies like Apotex, which is a very large generic company. Yes. They're promoting it in on their intranet as well as on their social media sites. We have a number of other members that reached out to us and said, we really want to get on board and promote that as well. So we do these promotion campaigns that the pharmacists that we that are a part of our program and act as our collection location sites really appreciate that because they can prepare. Yep. They know they're going to have an influx of medication. And then it slows down and I'll, they know that I've collected most of that now and I won't have to continually do that as part of my daily business. Right. And we do introduce alternate sites during those collection location or uh, campaigns. For example, any place that has a... Uh, um, security like a police mm -hmm. station uh because there's assume there may be opioids in whatever comes back we have to make sure it's protected from the public and can't be just left as a a bin available for example in an office building it has to be supervised by a pharmacist or um, a police officer absolutely absolutely and that that's fantastic to hear actually because you know by the time this episode will be aired um it'll be you know, in the month of July. So we'll, we'll right be in that in terms of the promotion part, like, you know, kind of raising that awareness for August being the drug drop off month. And we'll be sure to do our part in making sure that, you know, we are raising that awareness so that anyone who gets access to these videos will be able to, you know, do their part and make sure that they drop off at the nearest um, drop off location and check out your website, because I know you have listed a lot of drop off locate, like, you know, there's a good search um, function there to kind of find out the nearest drop-off location. So, you know, we'll be, we'll be sure to put the um, website in the description box below as well. So for anyone who wants to check it out can do so. Exactly. We have a geolocator and also on our website for pharmacy professionals, there's an uh, access to all of our educational assets. Oh. The videos, the how-to guides, we have bag stuffers, posters, anything that you would uh, require, you can download from our website. Much of it is QR coded. So if somebody wants to QR code, they, it goes directly to our website. So we're getting a little more sophisticated in how we, we <laughs> manage and uh, what they call the silver surfers. And we know that <laughs> consumer group are also getting equally sophisticated and are now reaching out to us and saying, I just want the QR code so I can access your, uh, your website. So uh, the other thing we're doing when we roll out new programs, ASCA, mm -hmm. which is very Important. We have two new programs being rolled out in New Brunswick and Quebec. As we're sending out surveys to the pharmacist to get a level set of our understanding, what do you currently do in your pharmacy? So if we can roll out a program that will be least the least disruptive to your business processes. Right. This is going to be very helpful and something new we haven't done before. Okay. So, um, and the other one thing I wanted to mention to you is we've worked with the University of Toronto uh -huh. on a sustainability assessment 
audit tool for yes. pharmacy. So this is very exciting. So a pharmacist thinks, I want to become more sustainable. I want to know where I am now and how I can move the, the, the gauge, so to speak, on, on becoming more sustainable. This self-assessment tool was developed, I think it was by uh, Leeds University and U of T. Uh -huh. And it references uh, all the questions, all of the topics about becoming a sustainable pharmacy and leads you in a decision tree if you think, if you say, uh, no, I'm not doing that, and then it will say, well, here are some resources to help you improve on that, which is, is quite exciting. So that is like, definitely exciting. And, you know, would love to, um, you know, we'll, we'll definitely be sure, like, you know, to sh make sure we rep uh, share reference to that website so that if anyone wants to have a look at that assessment tool and, you know, what, because I think this is actually one of the questions that I had for you was, you know, uh, how can pharmacy professionals and other healthcare providers for that matter, like, you know, choose sustainability, environment protection, like think of all those factors as, you know, we practice day to day in our clinical practice. And, and I think this tool would be a significant help. And I, I would, if I may dare say so, it might be one of the first tools out there to actually do a self-assessment self, a self um, to kind of gauge our own blind spots and our own understanding of sustainability and how our actions are impacting that. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Absolutely. We're very excited about it as well. And, and you're, you're absolutely right. To my knowledge, and we've done some research as well. It mm -hmm. is the first available tool specifically focused on sustainability within the pharmacy sector. So that's incredible. And I can't wait to have a look at that. And, um, you know, uh, also share the resource with the audience who will be tuning into this episode as well, because I feel like this is going to be one of those tools that you want to keep it in your toolkit. Uh, and Go, constantly go back in and reassess and just to, you know, see how, where you're flowing in that decision tree as you embark on this journey of sustainability. It's, it's, a, it's a huge journey, right? It's a way, it's a changing the way we think and um, we process and our, our workflow changes to a significant, uh, significant, uh, significantly as well. So um, change management and having a tool that helps us guide that change would be critical. Um, so I look forward to that. And I think as we were talking about this tool, I know you've also um, you know, as you're collecting more and more data uh, and, you know, through these surveys, if you were to summarize the impact your organization has been able to achieve so far, um, you know, how would you describe that? And like, you know, uh, what are some of the metrics that you measure uh, to, I guess, identify the impact, <laughs> if I may say so? So we, HPSA has actually been around for about 22 years. It's hard wow. to imagine. You know, with the uh, first program introduced in BC, uh -huh. And that was you know, almost well, 22 years ago. Uh, since that point now, we have over 6,000 pharmacies across Canada and our regulated provinces that participate. So we've expanded the programs. Just to give you an idea, we've collected since inception almost, well, over four and a half million kilograms of unwanted medical uh, medications and natural health products. Wow. OT products. I mean, it, it's it's hard to imagine that much and we're trying to come up with visuals to make it more impactful on our social media sites. But yeah, 4.6, over 4.6 million kilograms uh, of medication has been diverted from landfills and our wastewater. As well with medical sharps, I think it's over 3 million kilograms of medical sharps have been diverted from landfills. Wow. Uh, so we, we're certainly seeing an increase almost every year with uh -huh. the exception of our pandemic period yes. where the world shut down and nobody moved much outside of their home. We saw quite a, a dramatic dip in yes. uh, election rates, but then it rebounded quickly as people became more social again and uh, wanted to actually, we saw a really significant rebound because people were spring cleaning after COVID and they were cleaning out all kinds of things and wanted to have sort of a fresh start. So we really encouraged that and built up that with social media. So I think we're we're certainly making an impact. We track how much we uh, pick up and dispose mm -hmm. of. It's a regulatory requirement by the Ministries of Environment. We have an annual report. If anyone would like to see annually what we're collecting and disposing in the various provinces compared and trended over time, those annual consolidated reports are available on our website to the public as well. Oh, that's so nice. we. We, we seriously look at our data to track. We look at where there may be opportunities to improve collection. If we have a dip in pharmacy participation, mm -hmm. why that would be. Um, so yeah, we, we're, we're very data focused and that helps us ensure that 
Uh, we catch anything that may be causing um, issues with collection. Uh, the other thing I, I think we've really made an impact on is First Nations and Indigenous communities in remote areas. It's wow. very difficult sometimes yes. to in these areas. They may not even have a pharmacy in some of these areas. So we've partnered with other stewardship organizations like Batteries and Tires, and we organize a trip into some of these very, very remote areas together, coordinate it. So we go in and we provide them with an opportunity to, to give us all of this waste at one time. We communicate that ahead of time. So we do a, a collaborative effort to ensure we have access to uh, all communities in Canada, regardless of uh, the remoteness. That's incredible. And, and it's great that, you know, you're able to um, leverage through partnerships um, and, you know, gain access to these remote communities, because as you rightly mentioned, oftentimes there is no pharmacies in these remote communities and it's just medicine cabinets or, um, you know, that one building that may be all in one kind of like a hospital and a clinic and whatever you want to call it is all in one. And um, they may not have the facilities or the accessibilities, but this is, again, you know, incredible work in terms of preventing medications from entering into our environment in any way, shape or form. And this, this is so, so, so important. And I think as we are talking about that, you know, how, because I do understand that HPSA also supports patients and um, healthcare providers both alike, you know, in terms of um, disposing of medications and choosing sustainability. So if we were to break it down, how is HPSA supporting patients in, um, you know, being mindful of um, or being more aware uh, when it comes to medication disposal and any programs that you have for patients? So we formalized and built out a communications department at HPSA in the last three years. We have mm -hmm. two full-time assets and their focus is to uh, develop and implement consumer-focused campaigns. Mm. That could be through our social media, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram. I think we're even uh, about to be on TikTok. But so we try to find any way possible to reach consumers. Yes. We've partnered with Drugs Free Kids Canada uh, to, to in, because they have a consumer base as well that we're interested in tapping into. We also reach out to patient stakeholder groups. Mm -hmm. For example, Diabetes Canada. Very important stakeholder yes. group for us because yes. we want to ensure that any opportunity we have to interact with diabetic patients who may be on the radar of Diabetes Canada, that we can coordinate our messaging and make sure they're aware of the services, yes. that we have three sharps containers, um, that they can bring them back to the pharmacy, and how important it is to do that, and not put it in a juice bottle or a Javex bottle, for example, that th these things okay. are available, it's not an additional cost. And so we, we do have, have for, we formalized a number of partnerships with uh, patient advocacy groups. Mm. That's incredible. I mean, uh, you know, I know every the world's on TikTok. TikTok's a place to be where you are trying to gauge audience from all age groups, like everyone's there. Um, so it's, it's great to have that presence because that's really how you build that awareness, right? Like you need that collective uh, momentum to support the uh, support the incredible work that you're doing. And, you know, I can definitely relate to what you're mentioning about, you know, patients collecting needles and sharps and glass bottles. I've seen it all. Um, as a home care pharmacist, I have definitely seen it all where I have seen like you know juice bottles to cartons to cardboard boxes to everything and you know one of the common questions I always get from patients is yes my pharmacy gave me the sharps container but where do I take it back now you know once it's full somebody gonna come pick it up do I have to drop it off and so I feel like that awareness um, and that education becomes key um, and I'm so glad that you have a team that's now like focused on that part of it because that will help kind of close that knowledge gap and and, you know, raise more awareness so patients know that you pick it up from a pharmacy, you drop it off at a pharmacy or any other dedicated locations that uh, will accept these containers back. Um, and, you know, on a similar thought, um, you know, how what can pharmacy professionals and other healthcare providers expect in terms of supports and resources from HPSA? So, as you know, the program is free to any uh, pharmacist that wants to participate in the provinces in which we're regulated. So we provide all of the equipment, we provide all of the educational assets, uh, we will ensure service providers available, we will set a pharmacy up on frequency if that's mm. more compatible with their business model as opposed to having to call every time they need servicing. We often find that pharmacists will say, just set me up for you know once every two months, come 
deliver supplies, pick up the supplies in the night. I, it's seamless for me. Mm-hmm. So we'll do whatever basically the pharmacist needs us to do to accommodate their business and the, the, the um, busyness of the pharmacy. But we do offer everything, including the Sharps containers free. We will take back all Sharps containers that are Sharp container approved. Mm. So if somebody goes on Best Buy or Amazon and buys a Sharps container and brings it back to the pharmacy, uh, we're, we're trying to uh, make sure pharmacists are aware. We'll take those back as long as they're safe Sharps containers. Right. Just an HPSA Sharps container. We just want to make sure they get back to us yes. so they don't end up in the garbage. So that's more important than anything. What we won't take back, and we encourage pharmacists not to take back to your point, are the juice bottles or the, because it's a safety issue, as you know, that yes. could be a biohazard. So we advise patients here, take the sharps container, you take all those needles, you put them in the sharps container, and then you bring them back to the pharmacy so we can make sure that they're safely disposed of uh, from both the consumer's point of view as well as the pharmacist's point of view. Absolutely. And thank you very much for sharing that because, um, you know, reflecting back on my community pharmacy experience and, you know, I've had my share, I wouldn't say that many instances, but I have had my share where, um, you know, patients would come in with those glass bottles and I'll be like, "Mm, not taking that for sure. Uh, But at the same time, there are some other containers that may not look like the yellow containers that we are so traditionally used to seeing. Um, Is there like a resource that you have available on your website in terms of what are considered safe, um, you know, uh, sharps containers? Yes, we do have a guide. There is a resource. So if a uh, patient comes in and says, well, work, you know, if I need a bigger one or I want to access yeah. something different or I live in a province where this service isn't available, right. we have a, an asset that will outline all of the what we're aware of, are commercially available Sharps containers, the various sizes, what they look for, what 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 constitutes a safe Sharp container. Mm. So yeah, we're happy, happy to do that as well. And we actually t- just changed our Sharps container recently. And one of the things we did to engage with pharmacies, which we thought was very important, is we started attending some of their association conferences. Yes. So we would have our booth, a uh, manned booth. We would bring our assets. We would get to interact with pharmacies and said, what do you like about these assets? What mm. would you like to see changed? Are there things we could give you that would make your interaction with consumers easier or more effective? Right. Uh, bag stuffers, magnets, whatever we think we can do to help pharmacists further educate consumers. It's been valuable for us to be face-to-face with pharmacists uh, because they're such an integral part of our collection uh, system. Getting their direct feedback is is uh, very meaningful to us because it allows us to pivot. It allows us to change our strategic direction if need be and do it as quickly as possible. Absolutely. And, you know, kudos to you and your organization as well for involving that stakeholder, that critical stakeholder into these conversations, because really that's how you truly build successful, you know, projects and um, complete them, right? Because if there is something of a sticking point that's really not pushing the the needle forward, then we want to address it rather sooner than later. Um, and, you know, I would say I commend you for, you know, taking those surveys, especially with pharmacy pharmacists and pharmacy professionals to kind of understand, you know, what is it that can be done better to kind of help accommodate with the workflow? Because, uh, you know, I can certainly tell you from my own experience, pharmacies have been busiest that they have ever been in the history, um, you know, that we know of, just because of the sheer volume of services that pharmacy, pharmacists and pharmacies are now providing. Um, So any supports we can get to kind of streamline the workflow, it's always appreciated. Um, And I thank you for that. Um, And, you know, on that same note, I guess, you know, as as a leader in, in, you know, with uh, sustainability, um, in the sustainability space, and especially with the medication disposal space, how do you envision the future of healthcare and like pharmacy, especially from a sustainability lens, like, you know, what is it that we need to do better to integrate sustainability into uh, pharmacy practice or healthcare practice? So one of the things we're doing and looking at is going back to, uh, we participated in a PharmD session at uh, UBC Mm -hmm. to teach at source. So this becomes part of the curriculum of pharmacy. When you graduate, you have a sustainability lens already. We've also developed an accredited program for pharmacy technicians so that we can help because they're often yes. consumer and have an opportunity just to remind consumers how to do this. But there's so many other areas. Um, we have some thought leaders that are really leading the way in sustainability practice mm-hmm. that have partnered with us. Um, just looking at your carbon footprint and some of the interesting things I've read about are sustainable prescribing. 
Yes. This encouraging physicians and educating physicians now that pharmacists scope of practice has uh, been enhanced about what sustainable prescribing is yes. and the importance of it and the impact of some of the products on the market compared to others, for example, inhalers mm-hmm. uh, have a larger impact, a carbon footprint than, than a lot of the products. Understanding that and then even, and I dare I say without getting into trouble, even the drug approval process. Yep. That be part of the drug approval process. What's your carbon footprint for manufacturing this drug and the life cycle management of that yes. drug? So um, I think as we move forward, pharmacists can be advocates for some of this work. They can be educators to some of the uh, stakeholders, healthcare stakeholders around this. When you have a patient that has like five different inhalers and uh, gets really panicked when they think there may not be another puff left and just give me another one just in case. Yes. Um, understanding the impact it has and maybe helping to educate, you know, you really know when it's empty by doing this. I we used to put them in a thing of water and see, if, you know, and they float Oops. it. <laughs> but I think there's lots of opportunity and creative opportunity for pharmacists to, to move forward in the sustainability footprint outside of managing the waste stream. Very important and one we're keen to, to promote, but uh, certainly some of the thought leadership coming out of some of the pharmacists at U of T as well. We're really putting a serious lens on this first through the self-assessment tool, but other people are looking at it. There's a gentleman in Kingston who's doing some really cutting edge uh, initiatives in his pharmacy with regards to sustainability and, and managing his carbon footprint. So it's- Wow. That's incredible. And, and you know, again, that that's reassuring. And I agree with you. Like, you know, I think um, the collaboration is so critical uh, moving forward, making sure that healthcare providers, pharmacy, pro, uh, pharmacy professionals, for that matter, are working with um, organizations like HPA say, um, SA and collaborating so that, you know, we are able to raise this awareness and, you know, focus on medication disposal, but also focus on the steps prior to in terms of, you know, the, the first step, as you mentioned, like, you know, where medications even created in the first place, like, you know, are we looking at that? And then, you know, kind of going downstream from there and sustainable prescribing so important, um, especially now where we're seeing multiple healthcare professionals entering into the prescribing zone, right? It's now pharmacists, nurse practitioners, and physicians who are prescribing. Um, and, you know, we're, we're expecting that, that those powers will be expanding. Um, and as those powers, you know, with power comes responsibility, right? <laughs> Uh, making sure that we are not only looking at prescribing, but we are also looking at de-prescribing initiatives. And um, again, this is where the take back programs come in really handy is if we are stopping a medication for a patient, are we reminding them to take that medication back to the pharmacy or um, to the nearest disposal center so that it gets properly disposed of and it doesn't stay in the patient's house. Uh, Thank you very much for sharing that. And, you know, as we're wrapping up this conversation, um, I would love to kind of also hear, uh, you know, some of the initiatives that um, you are supporting on a community level or any initiatives that you have coming up that you wish to highlight? I know we spoke about the drug drop-off month in August, but any other initiative that you wish to highlight? So we have an ambassador program that we're running in Manitoba. And it's it's, uh, it's an interesting concept because we, again, gather with many of our other stewards for other products like batteries and tires and light bulbs. And it's a sort of a traveling road show that goes through Manitoba. And they have a a bus where they have all of these assets available to communities and they drive through these communities and park in public areas. And then just like the traveling libraries that used to be mm. my small hometowns, yes. but they then provide information and motivation to consumers to come by, ask them questions. What is this all about? Why is it important? So we're, we're, we're uh, coordinating with that. We're also for the drug drop-off month, advertising, as I said, on buses in uh, more urban areas. So people spend time, they're sitting on buses, they'll, they'll read maybe some of the, the, the literature that's available to them mm-hmm. on some of the screens, bus shelters as well, we're looking at uh, coordinating with. So reaching consumers is a very uh, difficult, challenging and costly uh, stakeholder group. So we're trying to find ways to do that in the most efficient way possible. Oftentimes, it's, it is to collaborate with other stewards of other mm-hmm. products, um, and, and we'll, we'll take full advantage of that. And again, as I said, even just 
collaborating with stakeholder groups that are relevant and, and making sure we can use their channels and they can co-promote on our channels. Right. So it's cooperation, um, for example, newsletters or um, the OPA does a newsletter, RX Talks, we're going to participate in that yes. and reach pharmacies. Um, we've done a number of podcasts. Mm -hmm. We've, uh, as I mentioned, we've uh, participated at, uh, with UBC in the PharmD program. We're looking to do more of that as well so we can embed sustainability right at the, the, the educational uh, component for pharmacy. And it just becomes natural to them as they graduate. They're looking for opportunities to enhance sustainability in their practice. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, I commend you for that because a lot of, a lot of time that early education is so important in terms of how we frame our way of thinking, right. And um, how we, we form those thought processes moving forward into our practice, because that's truly those formative years are where we, we kind of establish a routine to our practice. We like, I think of this, 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 and then, you know, this is how I do my clinical practice. Uh, so I commend you for, for integrating sustainability into that curriculum. That That's so important. And I, I look forward to hearing that, that this gets implemented in all of the programs possible because um, I can already see a value to it. Um, but, you know, for, for those who have already graduated like myself <laughs> um, and who are now, now just on the like you know on the, in the early stages of learning about sustainability and yet you know how can we implement sustainable um thinking or thought process into our practice and like you know be it professional or personal um you know as we wrap up this conversation i guess like is there any advice that you'd like to give in terms of what are some of the first steps to consider and you know in in when we're looking to implement sustainable solutions into our practice really let's well, self-serving of me to say, but the first thing you should do is sign up with HPSA and make sure you have that way stream acknowledged. Yes. Uh, think, um, looking at everything you do, every work process in a pharmacy is having, what impact does this have uh, on the environment? Um, and people don't often apply that lens. They they make want to make sure they're doing the safe thing, the right thing. They're protecting their patient's safety. They're prescribing and dispensing the right thing. But overlaying that environmental impact is so important as well. The safety of the patient in their home. Yes. So, you know, you put stickers on vials saying this may make you sleepy. Do not drive or operate heavy machinery. Well, this is equally as important. Do not keep these medications in your home indefinitely. And please do not take them if they're expired. Yes. Because with some of the shortages we're experiencing in Canada now, we found that we're getting a lot of comments back in our consumer survey saying, I'm keeping it just in case. Mm -hmm. Yes, we hear that a lot. <laughs> yeah. So I think pharmacists, when they, they, they start their practice, they have to make sure they're doing the right thing for their patient and they're being safe. But even the fax machines, uh, the amount of paper you use, yes. the plastic vials you use, like what's happening with them. To be curious, I think yes. curiosity is so important. Just asking, well, where do those vials go and how are they recycled and, and you know. What happens to them? <laughs> right? Well, I, I, but, I uh, agree with you. I agree with you. And this is, a, you know, perfect plug in, I guess, for self, you know, a self plug for myself at this point, I guess, because, you know, the series was, uh, uh, the, this was one of the first conversations we had was, you know, the plastic vials that we use in pharmacies, well, like, you know, what's the big deal about them? And like, you know, why are we so concerned of the material that we even use in these plastic vials? Because there is an impact, right? And how do we understand that? But this is, you know, what you mentioned is, is, is so important is like, you know, how do you look at all the processes that you have? And how do you look at what is the impact that you're having as you're following these processes, right? And like, it's thinking about the starting point all the way from the raw material all the way to the end, which is, you know, once a product is used, what are we going to do with it? Um, is it does it have reusable potential? Does it not have that? And if it doesn't, should we be using that? And how much should we be using that, right? And and I think that self-assessment that you have developed with UFT would be very critical, um, you know, in, in terms of kind of learning about those self, uh, you know, at least having the self-awareness to know where our blind spots are so that we can at least get the baby steps started. So thank you again for bringing that tool to us. Um, I know this is going to be one of those, I'm certainly going to be, do, um, you know, working through that tool and kind of learning about my own blind spots and happy to share uh, what I find as I go through that process. But uh, thank you, Terry. This was a fantastic conversation. I, I thoroughly enjoyed having you here and we learned so much about, you know, just 
how important medication disposal is um, and why doing it appropriately um, or medication waste um, is, is so important for not just our own health, but also for that of the environment and you know, with the other um, living organisms that we share this planet with. And, it, and you know, their health is just as important as ours. And we, we are responsible uh, for the waste that we create. So thank you for bringing that message and, you know, taking the time to have this conversation with, with me today. And, and I, I certainly can't wait to share this with the rest of our audience very soon. Asket, thank you very much. It's been a joy uh, speaking with you today. And uh, I look forward to, to uh, hearing the the podcast and sharing it as well on our social media sites to uh, enhance the acknowledgement of the importance of sustainability in pharmacy. Thank you very much, Terry. Um, and we'll certainly be uh, looking forward to that. And we'll make sure to link all the resources that you highlighted today in the description box below so that, you know, everyone who's listening can go to your website, check out the resources that you have, that you and your team have created with so much time and effort. Um, and I know for a fact that, you know, there are some of them that, you know, will be life changing and practice changing. Um, so we, we really look forward to that. But thank you again. And, uh, you know, I look forward to continuing these conversations down the road in the near future to, you know, learn more about the impact you'll be able to achieve as you grow this uh, program um, across the country. Thank you again. Thanks, Aska. Bye bye. All right. Bye bye. Take care. Before we move forward, I just want to also acknowledge Ecolo Farm for being our sponsor for the series uh, where we'll be speaking about sustainability in healthcare and in pharmacy. Ecolo Farm is a leader in sustainable development. Ecolo Farm was the first company to offer pharmacies eco friendly packaging products for dispensing medications. Their expertise consists in designing and manufacturing the most innovative, sustainable, and eco friendly packaging solutions in order to help pharmacies reduce their environmental impact. So make sure Ecolo Farm has always stood for innovative packaging for a greener future. And we could not be uh, asked for a better partner for the series um, as Ecolo Farm truly walks a talk um, and has been a pioneer in the space of creating green pharmacy solutions. It gives us an immense pleasure to be able to partner with Ecolo Farm to provide, to bring forward the series to you. And I hope you enjoy the series and learn from it and hopefully implement some of the solutions we discuss here um, as it will truly help our planet, um, especially curb climate change and make sure that we are able to grieve, um, you know, leave a greener planet for our future generations. And there you have it. You have heard it from Terry, the importance of safe disposal of medications and use sharps and the impact it has not only us, on us as humans, but also on you know other animals and living organis organisms on this planet and the aquatic system and our water supply and the far reaching impacts of a single decision that it, you know we make in terms of how we, how we choose to dispose our medications. To learn more about you know, the programs that HPSA offers and to also review the resources and the surveys and the annual report that Terry mentioned, be sure to check out the description box below as it contains all the links that you need um, and to all the, all the important documents that she highlighted. And I look forward to joining you again for our last episode of the series next week. Till then, take care. Bye-bye.